Hello, History 17B, Autumn Quarter 2023. I am having one of those days where I have to turn everything electrical that I touch off and on again because everything is behaving inexplicably. My scanner told me not to use a pen or object to when I was using my finger. So I may be partially undead. I'm really not sure. We ended Lecture 14 with the U.S. entering World War I, and Woodrow Wilson justifying this by saying, the world must be made safe for democracy, as opposed to shipping lanes must be made safe for American trade. Would be nice if we could just say what we actually meant. A number of groups within the U.S., including labor activists, Black Americans, and women, pointed out the irony of committing the U.S. to a fight for democracy abroad while not extending that right to groups at home. Woodrow Wilson's blind spots in terms of equality would extend to the plans for international peace at the end of the war. While the Austro-Hungarian and Ottoman empires dissolved, most European empires had no intention of withdrawing their claims on the world, especially when it came to the fortunes of their international trade and corporations. World War I officially ended, but this would not be the end of wars between Europeans, not by a long shot. And finally, in the wake of World War I, American women gained the right to vote at a national level, but other groups faced ever-increasing levels of violence, which the federal government made little to no effort to curtail. Even with Wilson's moderate preparedness policy, once the U.S. entered World War I officially, mobilizing the nation for a war was a monumental undertaking. The government had to coordinate not just troop training and movements, but feeding, clothing, transporting, and arming troops. Industry boomed, and more people were able to find paid employment, although equal treatment both in and out of the job did not materialize. As the U.S. quickly ramped up for war, the Wilson administration had to increase the size, power, and bureaucratic structure of the federal government. Close to 5,000 newly created agencies, not jobs, but agencies providing multiple jobs each, were required to coordinate manufacturing, transportation, agriculture, fuel, railroad traffic, shipping, and trade, and probably more that I haven't listed. The chart on the slide uses federal spending as a proxy for the size of the government. We see a spike for the Civil War, but then government spending dropped back to a fairly low level. Then you see the spike for World War I, and it is relatively gigantic. And although there is a dip after, federal expenditures start to grow again to counteract the Great Depression. And then, of course, we see World War II and a whole new world. Back to World War I, corporations had to work with the government to make certain everything ran smoothly. The War Industries Board purchased war supplies, set production quotas, and allocated raw materials. For once, this coordination benefited both corporate owners and many workers. U.S. industrial output grew by 20% in 1919, and profits for corporate owners rose accordingly, but this time not entirely at the expense of workers. Wilson had always favored progressive reforms when it came to white workers. Once the U.S. entered the war, it was critical to avoid strikes and maintain production, and Wilson found that progressive labor reform improved industrial function. The newly created War Labor Board mediated disputes between employers and workers. Eight-hour workdays improved wages and working conditions, as well as collective bargaining, became the required norm. As a result, organized labor was not inhibited, and union membership almost doubled from where it had been before World War I. So you can see it's reached a kind of plateau. World War I hits, it shoots up, and then it drops down again. But we are not there quite yet. 
You may recall from last lecture that U.S. public opinion showed stark splits, not only between pacifists and those anxious to see the U.S. take an active part in the war, but also in terms of where American sympathy lay between the Allied and Central Powers. Once the U.S entered on the side of the Allies, Wilson felt that such divisions would weaken U.S. performance in the war. So he created a propaganda campaign meant to get Americans to support both U.S. entry into World War I in 1917 and its entry on the side of the Allied powers. To accomplish this, he created the Committee on Public Information, or CPI, which produced pamphlets, speeches, films, and advertising in dozens of languages. This was also called the Creel Committee, C-R-E-E-L, after its main coordinator. While the committee carefully avoided the word propaganda, that was, of course, exactly what they produced. As you can see from the pair of images on the screen, the committee in many cases communicated through gender as well as ethnic stereotypes. While some federal control helped out the working class, and most of the propaganda was geared toward controlling public sentiment and not individual Americans, not all legal controls were even superficially benign. Wilson, concerned that there was still pro-German sentiment in the U.S., persuaded Congress to pass the Espionage Act of 1917. This imposed penalties of up to $10,000, $1917, not adjusted, and 20 years in prison for anyone convicted of aiding the enemy, obstructing military recruitment, or encouraging anything identified as, quote, disloyalty, which is rather broad and open to interpretation. The act also empowered the Postmaster General to confiscate and stop the distribution of any material considered treasonous. Again, a judgment open to interpretation. I've given you on the slide just the first page of the act with the summary enlarged. And that summary is to punish, this is for the Espionage Act of 1917, to punish acts of interference with the foreign relations, the neutrality, and the foreign commerce of the United States to punish espionage and better enforce the criminal laws of the United States and for other purposes. I've also shown paperwork for an indictment, again, with part and large so that you can see the Espionage Act was not just a threat, but was used to go after people and businesses. In 1918, the U.S. government doubled down passing the Sedition Act, which made it illegal in time of war to, quote, willfully utter, print, write, or publish any disloyal, profane, scurrilous, or abusive language about the form of government, the Constitution, the military or naval forces, the flag, or the uniform of the Army or Navy of the United States. At a minimum, 1,500 people were arrested for violations of the espionage and sedition laws. Some sources put the count much higher. We've seen the prejudice against immigrants, radicals, and labor organizations that advocated for larger social change with respect to big business. Officials at all levels used the Espionage and Sedition Acts to punish journalists and members, as well as leaders, of major labor reform groups that tended left of center. You can see in the cartoon that the IWW, here are the Wobblies, was targeted. And if you watched the earlier coda on Eugene V. Debs, then you know that he was arrested, convicted of sedition, and served a 10-year sentence for making an anti-war speech. Wilson was progressive when it came to non-socialist white labor. When it came to race relations, he was not. This did not stop Black Americans from being active participants in the war. The Marines refused outright to accept any Black members in World War I. 
the Navy would accept Black men, but would only allow them to do menial jobs, which, while absolutely essential, were and are rarely acknowledged. The War Department responded to pressure from Black Americans to create two Army combat units, two segregated units, but at least they existed. Both of these units served in France, and while facing extreme racism from most Americans abroad, they received recognition and medals from the grateful French who appreciated the bravery and service of Black American troops. Private Henry Johnson, whom you see on the right, fought off German soldiers, killing several and saving his fellow American soldier, Needham Roberts. This was in northern France on 15 May 1918. As you can see from the caption on the slide, Johnson received France's highest award for valor, the Croix de Guerre, and was even celebrated in the American press in the afterglow of World War I. However, despite receiving 21 wounds, Johnson did not receive a Purple Heart from the U.S. government. Of even greater moment to Johnson himself, when he returned to the U.S., he was given zero support and could not find a job. He died in his early 30s. Black Americans on the home front were absolutely essential to U.S. success in World War I. You may recall that from Reconstruction on, white Southerners depended on underpaid Black labor and also made laws limiting the mobility of Black Americans in the South. Black Americans did not just stay put. The South was a horrible place for them. And while the North was not that great, Black Americans did migrate North while carefully keeping familial and community ties in the South. Black Americans created a network that kept channels of contact open between urban communities in the North and rural ones in the South. Black newspapers, notably but not only, the Chicago Defender, which was founded in 1905, played a role in both the spread of relevant information through news and the maintenance of human contacts through personal ads. As war production ramped up, more and more jobs became available in northern cities, and more Black Americans moved north. This First Great Migration, as it's called, picked up during World War I, you can see on the slide, but you can also see from the chart here that it would not end when the war did, but would extend into the 1920s. Between 1915 and 1918, around half a million African Americans left the South, followed by another 700,000 at least, depending on the source you're looking at, or more in the 1920s. Southern Blacks living in the eastern seaboard generally headed to connections in northern cities on the east coast, like Boston, New York, Philadelphia, and Pittsburgh. Those from the westernmost states of the South often went to midwestern cities like Chicago, Cleveland, and Detroit. So many Black Alabamans moved to Cleveland that the Black community of the city was nicknamed Alabama North. More than half of the total number of migrants settled in five cities, Cleveland, Chicago, Detroit, New York, and Pittsburgh. Both men and women, Black men and women, found industrial work. Segregation at work depended on the company and the other workers at the company. In general, though, Black Americans were given lower-paying jobs, which effectively segregated them. Neighborhoods were generally completely segregated, partly because Black communities formed and reformed between South and North among people who knew one another, but largely because of hostility from white people. Black Americans had left the South for jobs, but also for safety and white neighborhoods were not always safe. In the Jim Crow South, segregation was de jour, meaning that segregation was mandated by law. This applied to pretty much everything in the Jim Crow South, and that is what Black Americans left behind during the Great Migration. In the North, segregation was not written into law, 
but it still existed as de facto segregation, which is segregation enforced by prejudice and social custom. And this was the reality of Northern cities, and it is what Black Americans found during the Great Mar Migration. As James Baldwin, one of those people, said, de facto segregation means that Negroes are segregated, but nobody did it, meaning white people claimed no responsibility for the situation. We will, sadly, be forced to come back to white racism and violence, but it gets to be much of a muchness. Far more interesting is the way that the Great Migration resulted in a surge in arts, literature, and music that would set a new course for Western culture. When it comes to literature and the Great Migration, I'm going to let Langston Hughes speak and Although I am not really the right person to read his work aloud, I am the lecturer that you have. This is The South by Langston Hughes. The lazy laughing South with blood in its mouth. The sunny-faced South, beast-strong, idiot-brained. The child-minded South, scratching in the dead fire's ashes for Negro's bones. Cotton in the moon, warmth, earth, the warmth, the sky, the sun, the stars. The magnolia-scented South. Beautiful like a woman, seductive as a dark-eyed whore, passionate, cruel, honey-lipped, syphilitic, that is the cell. And I, who am Black, would love her, but she spits in my face. And I, who am Black, would give her many rare gifts, but she turns her back upon me. So now I seek the North, for she, they say, is a kinder mistress. And in her house, my children may escape the spell of the cell. Harlem, the poem Harlem, or also called sometimes Dream Deferred for reasons that will soon become obvious, was published in 1951, but it expresses the second half of the Great Migration story, Harlem by Langston Hughes. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust over and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load or does it explode? Because the Black artists of the Great Migration changed what came before so substantively, it can be difficult to appreciate how innovative and different the poetry of someone like Langston Hughes was in its form and wording. Most people are more familiar with the origins and revolutionary impact of jazz music. Sometimes, to me at least, it sounds a bit like musicians came for jobs and just happened to bring different strains of music together in northern urban areas. This rather leaves the creation of artist communities explained by nothing but white racism, which was an external reality that Black artists had to deal with, not the source of their creativity. The coalescence of Black musicians in forming centers of jazz music came about through the encouragement and assistance of fellow musicians. Musicians who were already settled persuaded friends and colleagues to leave the South altogether. They facilitated these moves by finding jobs and living spaces. Jazz came about through creativity and mutual support, not half of the stance. The image on the slide is from 1922, and jazz, of course, gave the 1920s one of its many names, the Jazz Age. But we need to get the rest of World War I and the 1910s out of the way before we get there. I break out in hives every time someone says, in World War I, women stepped up and entered the workforce. In your pop culture package for World War I, you have a propaganda film that literally, I put a still from it there, shows a white housewife sitting at home eating bonbons and having to be told to go out and work. The text for it says, are you one of the women who are content to sit at home surrounded by luxury while our boys are cheerfully giving up their lives for you and me? The color ad on the right is less insulting, but still essentially makes it sound like women must be told what to do. Woman, your country needs you. Say it with me. Women 
already worked for wages and worked in factories. While employment numbers did rise somewhat for women during World War I, it was not because men told them to. It was because they could finally get hired. And for those who already had jobs, they could move into new ones with higher pay. I see a difference between stepping up and finally getting a chance to be hired for decent pay. Women did not suddenly wake up in the 1910s or the 1920s or the 1960s or the 1990s. The type and number of jobs available changed, not women. And although they could finally get what were called men's jobs, they did not usually get men's pay. The woman in the image on the left is making grenades. The woman women, actually there's more than one that you can see enough of to tell, the women on the right are making bombs. Pictures of older working class women tend to be rare, not because women go poof and disappear when they reach 35, but because they don't make the same sort of favored image for propaganda and news. As you can see from the color sign in the middle, which says, we are ready to work beside you fight beside you and die beside you. Let us vote beside you. Working women continued to remind men that democracy over there was great, but it would be great to have democracy for half the population at home as well. These on the slide here tend to be more familiar suffrage images than those of the working class, at least as the time of recording. Women in the older generation of suffrage activists, and you see some of them pictured here, they suggested a moderate course during World War I so as not to alienate male politicians. Now, I am not going to criticize them for that fact. They had spent literally their lifetimes trying to make changes, committing civil disobedience, and chipping away at social attitudes. Women like Alice Paul, who were younger, less tired, and less patient, did things like chaining themselves to the White House gate, as you can see there in the slide, and addressing President Wilson directly, which you can see better on the close image to the right, which says, Kaiser Wilson, have you forgotten your sympathy with the poor Germans because they were not self-governed? 20 million American women are not self-governed. Take the beam out of your own eye. As many of you know, the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, ratified in, by the states in 1920, made it illegal to ban women from voting because they were women. And I've said before, it's important to look at what an amendment actually does and what it does not do. So it didn't really guarantee women the right to vote. It made it illegal to ban women from voting because they were women. We know that constitutional amendments are not absolute guarantees, but the passage of the 19th Amendment was a landmark moment. You may have noticed that the last constitutional amendment in earlier lectures that we covered before this was the 17th Amendment, Direct Election of Senators. We skipped over the 18th Amendment, which, like the 19th, was a watershed, but in a far less positive way. The 18th Amendment was, of course, prohibition. Backers of prohibition came out hard during World War I with the idea that alcohol would weaken the country. You can see that in these posters. The one on the left shows a soldier in the trenches, and it says, will you back me or back booze? The one in the middle says, the saloon backer is traitor to his country. And the one on the right has a version of America with the freedom cap and the flag there as a woman stamping on a man who is made as a caricature of a European immigrant. And the America as this woman is yelling at the guy on the ground, non-essential, and he has booze written on him. In fact, many of our boys were not best pleased to return to a dry country. Now let's look at the 
wording in the amendment itself. The manufacture, sale, or transportation of intoxicating liquors within the importation thereof into or the exportation thereof from the United States and all territories subject to the jurisdiction thereof for beverage purposes is hereby prohibited. What about consumption? The word consumption or its equivalent is not in there. In fact, if you were wealthy and had an extensive wine cellar already, you were A-OK. The 18th Amendment ended up mainly as a club to beat the poor, the working class, and people of color. I have mentioned before that Woodrow Wilson improved life for the white working class with progressive legislation. On issues of racial abuse and violence, he did worse than nothing. I dithered about including the movie poster on the left for the hugely popular film, The Birth of a Nation, but I have found that if I just explain it, people don't get just how horrifying it is. The gist of the film is that rampaging Black people, played by white men in blackface, threaten a virtuous family, including a young woman. She is rescued by someone dressed as a literal white knight, although you can see from the poster if you read it, it was an acknowledged reference to the Ku Klux Klan. Woodrow Wilson screened the film at the White House in 1950. This was not a situation that would reduce white racism or injustice against Black Americans. I was going to use one of the quotations you can find online attributed to Woodrow Wilson's endorsement of film, but I did some poking around and instead decided to quote historian Mark E. Benba. More important than whatever was said or not said, Wilson gave the filmmakers all the endorsement they needed by agreeing to view the film in the White House. The screening was in itself a tacit endorsement sufficient to protect the film from censors and to allow it to be shown around the country. While the film probably would have been a hit even if Wilson had never seen it, his viewing it made the filmmaker's task easier. Moreover, Wilson's other racist policy, such as introducing Jim Crow to the federal government, which was in a lecture or so ago, are enough to place his administration in the bottom tier of presidencies for civil rights and race relations. Apocryphal, that means they're not really true. Apocryphal quotations are simply not needed for the historian to illustrate Woodrow Wilson's policies on race when the facts are sufficient. In fact, lynchings soared across the U.S., wherever Black people had settled. I have given you readings from Balto, Simon Balto, that deal with the Red Summer of 1919. The rest of the book is good as well if you want to check it out. Part of the reason I give you introductions or single chapters to many different things is with the idea that you will find something that you like in there. During the Red Summer of 1919, what were referred to as race riots, even by the major Black paper, The Defender, swept through 26 northern cities to which Black people had migrated. Such violence had happened before, as in East St. Louis in 1917, and as you have seen through the course of this class. But 1919, with 26 cities, nearly simultaneous attacks is legendary for a bad reason. You've seen me critique the use of the word riot when we talked about the massacre of Chinese American workers. Riot suggests that all groups were equally involved, and that just was not the case. I substitute my own phrase to make the history more clear. Instead of race riot, I prefer the phrase white rampage because most of the people killed that summer were Black and all of the neighborhoods destroyed were Black. When you read the Balto piece, keep in mind the discussion of de facto segregation that I gave earlier in this lecture. The violence against African-Americans 
and the failure of the U.S. government to combat it was the most horrific violence within the United States in 1919, but by no means the only violence. On 1 May 1919, May Day, postal officials discovered 20 bombs in the mail sent to prominent capitalists, including John D. Rockefeller and J.P. Morgan Jr., as well as government officials like Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes. A month later, bombs exploded in eight American cities. We have seen WASP, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, suspicion of European immigrants building for a long time now. And many white Americans, including those in government, blamed the bombings on radicals who had immigrated from Europe. Let me just say, if that was true, it was true of a few people. That does not equate the character of an entire group. The end of World War I was also accompanied by a panic over political radicalism after the Russian Revolution and political turmoil beginning, to U.S. views, in 1917, followed by the formation of Soviet Russia, as you see on the map there. Fear of bombs, communism, and labor unrest, and one of those is not like the others, produced a red scare, a so-called red scare, in the U.S. in which white Americans beat and killed immigrants from Eastern Europe. In November 1919, American legionnaires stormed an office of the International Workers of the World, the IWW, or the Wobblies. Townspeople overpowered the IWW members and took them to jail. A mob broke into the jail, seized one of the IWW workers. So this is happening to an IWW worker, a um, wobbly. They hanged him from a railroad bridge. Federal officials subsequently prosecuted 165 IWW leaders who received sentences of up to 25 years in prison. And that's what you see in the left. And in the right, you see a political cartoon of the U.S. kicking out other people. And you see the little bomb flying up here. Congress and state legislatures joined in the attack on radicalism. Although you may have figured out already from the history leading up to this point that radicalism meant those seeking workers' rights, and anyone who thought about one of those scary European political philosophies like socialism. I love this cartoon on the right. It shows the foot of labor, and the first step it's stepping on is strikes and walkouts. And then that leads inevitably to the next step, disorder and riots. And that leads inevitably to the next step, Bolshevism and murders, which leads to chaos, which leads to this big question mark, who knows where? It's called Step by Step. In 1919 and 1920, President Wilson's Attorney General, A. Mitchell Palmer, led raids on leftist organizations such as the Communist Party and the poor IWW. Palmer, incidentally, hoped to use the issue of radicalism as a way to become president in 1920. Although he claimed to be ridding the country of the, and I put it in quotes because seeing is believing, moral perverts and hysterical neurasthenic women who abound in communism. Palmer created the precursor to the FBI or Federal Bureau of Investigation, which collected the names of thousands of known or suspected communists. In November of 1919, Palmer ordered government raids, arresting 250 suspected radicals in 11 cities. The so-called Palmer raids reached their highest, or lowest, depending on how you view it, point on to January 1920. Government agents made raids in 33 cities, arresting more than 4,000 alleged communists and jailing them without bond. Two anarchists were executed for robbery and murder. That would be Sacco and Gonzetti. I will refer you back to the pattern set in the Haymarket Affair and with the IWW songwriter Joe Hill, both of whom were executed. 
Whatever Sacco and Vanzetti may or may not have done, we are unlikely to know as they did not get a fair trial. That gives us an idea of race and labor relations heading into the Jazz Age or the Roaring Twenties in the U.S. Let's zoom back out to look at the world in the wrap-up of World War I. Woodrow Wilson's foreign policy was pretty much his domestic policy writ large. His famous 14 points include the first five, open diplomacy, freedom of the seas, arms limitation, free trade, and this part is in quotes, impartial adjustment of all colonial claims. Points 6 to 13 have to do with self-determination, freedom of the people of a and it's understood, a European state or territory to choose their own governments. And the 14th point was the League of Nations, an international organization to promote global cooperation and preserve peace. When it came to one to five, Wilson's negotiations ignored the newly formed Pan-African Congress, who were, wait for it, not white. Japan submitted a proposal for racial equality to be included in the final statement of the peace treaty, and the U.S. struck it down. Wilson's racism, combined with the absolute refusal of the European empires to quit being empires, made for redrawing maps. But pretty much with the same petty and imperialist goals as all preceding European peace treaties had done. And despite the fact that the League of Nations was Wilson's idea, it was the U.S. government that refused to join. Here is on the slide the map of Europe in 1919. France and Germany are still quibbling over their mutual borders. In an effort to secure self-determination, two populations conquered by the now non-existent Austro-Hungarian Empire. We see countries like Czechoslovakia, abbreviated here, Romania, and Yugoslavia. The Russian Empire is still in turmoil, but we can see Soviet Russia consolidating control. Finland is its own separate country. I won't go through all of Africa, but we do still see France in North Africa, a lot of North Africa, and Great Britain in Egypt. The Ottoman Empire has pretty much gone, and Turkey is in the process of coming into being as a nation. This is a map of what we call the Middle East in 1919, and including parts of South Asia. The European delegates from the Allied powers to the treaty conference, the peace treaty conference of World War I, redistributed land that had been held by the German and Ottoman empires. When it came to the former Ottoman Empire, European negotiators called what they came up with the mandate system rather than colonialism. But none of the people colonized really bought that. And they were both bemused and angry that somehow the 14 points did not apply to them. The European powers who won World War I declared themselves obligated to continue ruling over other people who clearly, in the minds of Europeans, not being European, were not civilized and ready to govern themselves. France had a mandate for Syria and Lebanon. Britain, a mandate for Iraq, Transjordan, and Palestine. In fact, let's just say that you can see the British pink and the French blue expanding over this map, and we see a host of conflict zones just in December of 1919 here. Asia was more embroiled than ever. Nationalist movements took hold in places like China, Tunisia, Indonesia, Egypt, and India. I recognize that Egypt is not technically within Asia, but you get the clustering of those countries and what's going on. The Vietnamese, here we are, it's still called French Indochina, asked President Wilson to apply his 
quote, self-determination ideal to them and boot the French. Clearly, Wilson did not rise to the challenge, as you see the French not only still there, but expanding forcefully into Siam or Thailand. Japan did not get the anti-racism statement they wanted, but they did keep get to keep tendrils in China as well as all of Korea. The U.S. has Hawaii, Midway, Wake Island, American Samoa, Guam, the Philippines, and now down here, a port in the region of Timor. My formatting on this particular slide went a little bit awry on me, but I think that you can get my point just looking at it anyway. These are the wars for Europe that I could fit on one slide. I've highlighted World War II at the end, clearly calling World War I the war to end all wars was overly optimistic. Key points to lecture 15. When the U.S. joined World War I, the Wilson government created federal departments and committees to coordinate everything from agriculture to transportation to industrial production. Wilson's policies were largely favorable to labor. They included things like the eight-hour day, fair wage, factory safety, and so on. And it did this without unduly curtailing owners' profits. Wilson also pushed for the creation of the Committee of Public Information, the CPI, or Creole Committee, or Propaganda Department, as well as the passage of the Espionage and Sedition Acts of 1917 and 1918. On the ground, these were often used to oppose labor leaders. Black Americans had to push for them but eventually managed to join two segregated army units. They both, both of the units, served with distinction in France during World War I. During the first migration, hundreds of thousands of Black Americans left the lynching and Jim Crow of the South to join family and community in northern industrial cities like Chicago and New York. These people kept the expanded wartime industrial production of the U.S. going. Despite having jobs and, in most cases, actual voting rights in the North, Black Americans who migrated to Northern cities were still met with violence and de facto segregation. This reached a crescendo in the Red Summer of 1919, which saw white mobs murder Black Americans and destroy Black urban neighborhoods in 26 cities across the U.S. In the era beginning with the Great Migration, Black artists made huge contributions to American and global culture. The best known of these is probably jazz music. During World War I, women were able to get more jobs and better paying jobs. Different groups of women, including the working class, continued to push for women's suffrage using multiple approaches. Their efforts succeeded with the 19th Amendment ratified by the states in 1920. The 18th Amendment, Prohibition, went through in 1919 after an especially powerful campaign during World War I. The first Red Scare got impetus from fear of the Russian Revolution, localized bombings in the U.S., and the continuing confusion over different labor political theories like socialism and communism. The leader of the Palmer Raids, claimed to be ridding the U.S. of the, I just quote it again, moral perverts and hysterical neurasthenic women who abound in communism. While purporting to protect the U.S. from communism, the Red Scare mainly saw the targeting of leftist thinkers, immigrants, and labor leaders. The combination of allied leaders' racism and this included Wilson, and the unwillingness of empires to release their grip on the globe resulted in a so-called mandate system that, while pretending not to be colonialism, carved up the defeated empires of Germany, Austro-Hungary, 
and the Ottomans into what were essentially even larger colonial holdings than countries like Great Britain and France had on the eve of World War I. The treaty concluding World War I, far from seeing the end of all wars, actually created a plethora of conflicts throughout Europe, Africa, the Middle East, and Asia. We left off part one of our coda with the Allied powers preventing the Central Powers, and in particular Germany, from accessing usable nitrates from South America. And remember, usable nitrates means the nitrogen is fixed, so it's available for use as either fertilizer or as a component of explosives. It is impossible to overstate the degree to which European nations had come to depend on fixed nitrogen, not only for war munitions, but quite simply to feed their people. Sir William Crookes, president of the British Association for the Advancement of Science, whom I have actually shown here because of his interesting facial hair, devoted his address to the scientific community in 1898 to the issue of nitrogen fixation. He pointed out that even with massive nitrate imports from guano and deposits in Chile, Britain was able to produce only 25% of the wheat which it consumed, making it reliant on other countries for the remainder. As he saw it, quote, England and all civilized nations stand in deadly peril of not having enough to eat. That's for other people. Crooks believed that the solution lay with the sort of people in his audience. He exhorted them, again, quote, it is the chemist who must come to the rescue of the threatened communities. It is through the laboratory that starvation may ultimately be turned into plenty. His words were to prove prophetic, but it would be Germany and not Britain, which first implemented the fixation of nitrogen on a meaningful industrial scale. By the time he gave the 1898 address in Bristol, Crookes had firsthand experience with nitrogen fixation from air. He had, this is a quote from the newspapers at the time, put the air on fire with an electric arc, oxidizing nitrogen into nitrates in a process similar to that which occurs in nature in the presence of lightning. Meanwhile, in 1892, a Canadian inventor working in the United States had produced calcium carbide, which will react with atmospheric nitrogen by combining lime, that would be calcium oxide, not the fruit, and coal tar in a high temperature electric arc furnace. The amount of electricity needed to produce useful amounts of fixed nitrogen by either process proved problematic. Crookes proposed hydroelectric power as a source, and the Spectator article which reported on Crookes' address joked that, quote, Niagara alone can supply the required energy. In fact, Norway had sufficient hydroelectric power and did construct a nitrogen fixation plant. The nitrogen it produced scarcely supplied the country's own domestic needs. This state of affairs brings us to the complicated figure of Fritz Haber, the man who won the 1918 Nobel Prize in Chemistry for developing the process that feeds the world. Born to Jewish parents in 1868 in what is now Roklaw, Poland, but was then Breslau, Prussia, Haber renounced his Judaism for practical reasons. Academic opportunities for Jews were limited in most European countries at the end of the 19th century. In 1898, the year Crookes was calling for chemists to solve the issue of industrial nitrogen fixation, Haber was appointed Professor Extraordinarius at the Kohlsruhe. I, for those of you who speak German, I apologize. The Kohl Kohlsruhe Institute of Technology, and Haber also published a textbook on electrochemistry. In the preface to the book, he made it clear that one of his goals was to apply his chemical research to industry. 
He set himself, among other goals, to finding the correct combination of pressure, temperature, and catalyst, which could convert atmospheric nitrogen into ammonia by reacting it with hydrogen. In 1909, he succeeded and was able to produce about half a liter of ammonia in an hour using a process which, critically, required relatively little energy and no waterfalls. Haber demonstrated the process to two scientists, Alwyn Matash and Carl Bosch. Bosch will show up again. They were both from the company Badish, Anlin, and Soba Soda Fabri. You may be more familiar with it, and I can say it better as BASF, which is still a company. It took a few years to scale up the system of fixing nitrogen, making it commercially viable. But by 1912, the Haber-Bosch process had been refined. By 1913, Carl Bosch, who would later be awarded a Nobel Prize in Chemistry of his own, had opened the first factory to produce synthetic ammonia, the Stickstoff work or nitrogen works in Oppau, Germany. If you have been keeping track, you will have noticed that this was a year before the Battle of Carnell that we talked about off the coast of Chile. Germany already knew that it had the capacity to produce nitrogen for fertilizer and explosives to absolutely necessities if it was going to wage war by the time that Gavrilo Prinkep assassinated Archduke Franz Ferdinand in Austria in Sarajevo on 28 June 1914, starting the cascade of declarations of war. It was this industrial supply that kept Germany going for as long as it did in World War I. I mentioned earlier that Haber was a complicated figure in history. If you read his official biography on the Nobel website, you will find in among truly phenomenal list of achievements, one particular almost innocuous sentence. When the First World War broke out, he, Haber, was appointed a consultant to the German War Office and organized gas attacks and defenses against them. A staunch German patriot, he is considered by many to be the so-called father of chemical warfare. He personally supervised the release of a 168 tons of chlorine gas on Allied troop in Ypres and 22 April 1915, killing over 5,000 by asphyxiation in a matter of 10 minutes. For this, Haber was given by Germany the rank of captain, and in May of 1915, he attended a party given in his honor in Berlin. After the party, his wife, Clara Emmerwar, a brilliant chemist in her own right, who vehemently opposed Haber's involvement with weapons research, shot herself in the heart with her husband's army pistol, purportedly dying in the arms of their 13-year-old son. Haber left the next day to oversee gas attacks against Russian forces on the Eastern Front. Of course, the story of humanity's fixation with nitrogen, I, I resisted that as long as I could. Anyway, it does not end with Fritz Haber and World War I. The high explosives and bombs of World War II required a steady supply of reactive nitrogen. But even before we get there, during the 1930s, the United States government had already invested millions of dollars in researching and building nitrogen plants, many of them near the hydroelectric dams of the Tennessee Valley Authority to provide fertilizer. From the advent of the Second World War, the U.S. added 10 new large-scale plants in the country's interior, this time expressly to produce ammonia for munitions. By the time President Truman marked the end of World War II by declaring 2 September 1945 to be VJ Day, all of those plants combined were producing 730,000 tons of ammonia. 
and they had the capacity to produce 1.6 million tons. What could be more natural than to turn all of that nitrogen-rich ammonia into fertilizer now that it was no longer needed for bombs? Crop yields rose, and with a plentiful and reliable supply of nitrogen, farmers could focus on one or two major cash crops in all of their fields year after year without fear of depletion. Now that nitrogen was no longer a limiting factor, new hybrid strains of commercially valuable cultivars, like corn, could be developed. These depended on increased fertilizer applications, but in return, they provided extremely high yields. As the production and use of nitrogen fertilizers skyrocketed in the decades following World War II, so did the world population. Estimates vary, as always, but most researchers agree that without synthetic nitrogen, between a half and a third of the world's people could not exist. That's somewhere in the neighborhood of 3.5 billion people. And you can see that change. Population is chugging along. And we get to the area era of fixing nitrogen and post-World War II, and the world population in all regions shoots up. Now, it is tempting, always tempting, to turn numbers like that, 3.5 billion people, into other people, other lives. It's difficult to get our heads around something so massive. So let's rephrase it a bit. Some writers like to say that about half of the nitrogen in your body comes from fertilizer. But let's face it, if you live in a so-called developed nation, that percentage is likely to be much higher, even if you buy organic. Without nitrogen fertilizer, we, you and I, would not be here. At the same time, humanity's relationship with nitrogen is genuinely problematic. The spectacular explosive potential of ammonium nitrate fertilizer tends to garner the most press for obvious reasons. The explosion that you see on the slide there of the West Fertilizer Company facility outside of Waco, Texas, on 17 April 2013, not only obliterated the entire plant, but also destroyed or damaged nearby buildings and homes, and also a school and a nursing home. The West Texas explosion may not be the freshest in our collective memory because it is by no means unique. Probably the most familiar disaster involving nitrates to you all now will be the one on 4 August 2020 that obliterated the port of Beirut. A fire at the Beirut port caused the detonation of 2,750 tons of ammonium nitrate, which had been improperly stored in a port warehouse for years. The ammonium nitrate, which we know can be used to make fertilizer or explosives, arrived in Beirut in 2013 on a multiple flagged ship making its way from Georgia, the country, not the U.S. state, to Mozambique. The Rosas merchant vessel, owned by a Russian businessman, was forced to dock in Beirut after facing technical problems at sea. The ship was subsequently impounded by Lebanese authorities for failing to pay port fees. In 2014, the ship's cargo was finally unloaded, only to be casually stored in a warehouse in the port, where it caught fire in 2020. The result was 212 deaths, 7,000 injuries, and an estimated 300,000 people left homeless. The tall buildings that you see, they're white here, and you can see the explosion behind them. So this picture is taken from this side over here. And these buildings are, or rather were, grain silos holding about 120,000 tons of grain, which you can see spread over this huge extent here. These massive towers actually protected parts of Lebanon, which is how the person could take the picture here, from the main blast. But replacing them has presented a challenge. Since the last pictures were taken, part of the silos 
have collapsed. You can see that there. And part have caught fire. Usually one leads to the other. And although there is talk of demolishing the last remnants, the latest articles that I could find still showed part of these destroyed silos standing. Once the grain is exposed for an extended period, it must be sprayed with pesticides or it will grow some rather nasty to humans fungi. It also begins to ferment and become more vulnerable to fire. Lebanon relies on grain imports, and until silos this large are rebuilt here or elsewhere, storage places a limit on how much grain Lebanon can import. It's not like the dangers of producing and storing ammonium nitrate is unknown or was not properly understood until recently. Remember Karl Bosch's original BASF plant in Abau, Germany? It exploded on 21 September 1921, killing 561 people outright and leaving 750,000 homeless. And you can see the crater that used to be the factory there. It is not only production and storage, but also transport that ammonium nitrate has the potential to be dangerous. On 16 April 1947, in Texas City, Texas, the SS Grand Camp, a ship that you can't see because it's covered by the explosion in the image, loaded with over 2,000 tons of ammonium nitrate caught fire. The resulting explosion not only took out the SS Grand Camp, it triggered a chain reaction of explosions on other ships and at oil storage facilities, leaving 581 people dead. In one of history's fascinating coincidences, on the 80th anniversary of the explosion in Opau, 21 September, now 2001, Ammonium nitrate stored in the AZV factory in Toulouse, France, exploded, leaving a crater, which you see there, 200 meters across and at least 20 meters deep, and damaging buildings within a radius of over 700 meters. Staggering as this explosion was, the terrorist attacks of 9-11 or 11 September overshadowed it in much of the news coverage outside of France. This reminds us that not all explosions are accidents. Neither do they all require planes or people from outside the U.S. American citizens Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols used two tons of ammonium nitrate fertilizer combined with racing fuel and a blasting cap to destroy the federal building in Oklahoma City on 19 April 1995, killing 168 people. The bombers found the conspiratorial world of militia culture persuasive, and they viewed the bombing as a justifiable attack against the federal government of the United States. And in this, the murder of innocence was characterized, in McVeigh's words, as collateral damage. This included the daycare in the building, where 15 children died, although six were successfully extracted from the rubble. Despite their headline and heart-grabbing nature, nitrate explosions do not pose a major threat to most of us. The real problems with nitrogen fertilizer are much more mundane and accretionary. Accretionary. That means they build up over time. One of the biggest issues is that nitrogen is a nutrient, but it does not all end up nourishing crops. Agricultural runoff in rain or irrigation water carries available nitrogen into lakes rivers, oceans, and public reservoirs, which can change the entire ecosystem. Algae thrive in this nitrogen bath. The famous red tide, and you see an aerial shot of one of these on the slide, is the result of an algae proliferation, which produces chemical toxins, killing fish, impacting commercial fisheries, and sickening people who eat tainted shellfish. Even non-toxic algal blooms 
can be devastating as they deprive other organisms of oxygen. Dead zones produced by these nitrogen-fed algae proliferations occur worldwide with real consequences for humans. The collapse of the Baltic cod fishery in the 1990s was one result. The Gulf of Mexico dead zone at the mouth of the Mississippi River is one of the most famous dead zones and probably more familiar to you than the Baltic cod fishery. The dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico varies in size each year, but can easily cover 6,000 to 7,000 square miles or about half of Belgium. Reactive nitrogen doesn't just show up in water. It can also enter air as nitric oxide, NO, where it is a component of smog. As nitrous oxide, N2O, in the atmosphere, it is a greenhouse gas. And nitrogen oxides contribute to the acidity in acid rain. That all seems incredibly bleak. And if like me, you once had a soft spot for 1970s dystopian sci-fi, you may find your thoughts turning in that direction now. I've put the posters for two movies up there, and I will just point out that the apocalypse happened before 2022. Should we balance population and consumption a la Logan's run by killing off everyone as soon as they turn 30? Are we doomed? In the world of Soylent Green, where all but the privileged few live in overcrowded, polluted, and stagnant poverty, munching on our fellow humans in the form of high-nutrient green wafers. I rather hope not. This is the point in the coda where I want to tell you all of the research that is being done on new methods of agriculture, responsible fertilizer use, and groundbreaking chemistry. And I could certainly do that because people out there are involved in all of those. But instead, I would like to point out that humans, while often slow to see problems, nevertheless like to try to solve them. I am not a believer in progress in the sense that things inevitably get better. But realistically, we cannot go back. Whatever is done is irrevocably done. People like me who enjoy looking back in time, are not generally the best prognosticators, but I think that it is probably safe to say that whatever new solutions humans develop, whether it is for nitrogen fixation or for rescuing the planet from complete destruction, whatever solutions we come up with will have drawbacks and unforeseen complications. And we will debate long and hard about whether the good outweighs the bad.